Chapter 8 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering, and two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. And gather thou all the congregation together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the assembly was gathered together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses said unto the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons, and washed them with water. And he put upon him the coat, and girded him with the girdle, and clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod upon him. And he girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod, and bound it unto him therewith. And he put the breastplate upon him. Also he put in the breastplate, the urim, and the thummim. And he put the mitre upon his head. Also upon the mitre, even upon his forefront, did he put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. And Moses took the anointing oil, and anointed the tabernacle, and all that was therein, and sanctified them. And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times, and anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the laver and his foot, to sanctify them. And he poured the anointing oil upon Aaron's head, and anointed him to sanctify him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons, and put coats upon them, and girded them with girdles, and put bonnets upon them, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he brought the bullock for the sin offering. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bullock for the sin offering. And he slew it. And Moses took the blood, and put it upon the horns of the altar round about with his finger, and purified the altar, and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar, and sanctified it, to make reconciliation upon it. And he took all the fat that was upon the inwards, and the caul above the liver, and the two kidneys and their fat, and Moses burned it upon the altar. But the bullock and his hide, his flesh and his dung, he burnt with fire without the camp, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he brought the ram for the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram. And he killed it, and Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. And he cut the ram into pieces, and Moses burnt the head and the pieces and the fat. And he washed the inwards and the legs in water, and Moses burnt the whole ram upon the altar. It was a burnt sacrifice for a sweet savour, and an offering made by fire unto the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he brought the other ram, the ram of consecration. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram. And he slew it, and Moses took of the blood of it, and put it upon the tip of Aaron's right ear, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And he brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put of the blood upon the tip of their right ear, and upon the thumbs of their right hands, and upon the great toes of their right feet. And Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. And he took the fat and the rump, and all the fat that was upon the inwards, and the caul above the liver, and the two kidneys and their fat, and the right shoulder. And out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he took one unleavened cake, and a cake of oiled bread, and one wafer, and put them on the fat, and upon the right shoulder. And he put all upon Aaron's hands, and upon his son's hands, and waved them for a wave offering before the Lord. And Moses took them from off their hands, and burnt them on the altar upon the burnt offering. They were consecrations for a sweet savour. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And Moses took the breast, and waved it for a wave offering before the Lord. For of the ram of consecration it was Moses' part, as the Lord commanded Moses. And Moses took of the anointing oil, and of the blood which was upon the altar, and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his garments, and upon his sons and upon his sons' garments with him, and sanctified Aaron and his garments, and his sons and his sons' garments with him. And Moses said unto Aaron and to his sons, Boil the flesh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and there eat it with the bread that is in the basket of consecrations, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it. And that which remaineth of the flesh and of the bread shall ye burn with fire. And ye shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days, until the days of your consecration be at an end. For seven days shall he consecrate you. As he hath done this day, so the Lord hath commanded to do, to make an atonement for you. Therefore shall ye abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord, that ye die not. For so I am commanded. So Aaron and his sons did all things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Chapter 3 
Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The end of the second epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Thessalonians. Good morning and a happy Sabbath to you. I trust you had a good rest and you feel refreshed. Now, today being the day following Good Friday, the day when Christ was crucified, we want to share a few words concerning the death of Jesus on the cross in our behalf. The death of Jesus on the cross in our behalf. And so we'd like to say a few words concerning 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. And then we will intercede for those who have made requests. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4 states, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures again, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and verse 4, Paul under inspiration says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Let us pray, Heavenly Father, please bless your word to our hearts at this time. In Jesus' name, Amen. Paul says, first of all, he says, For I delivered unto you first of all. First of all could mean first in order of presentation or first in terms of importance. And so the Apostle Paul lists four important facts that he had given to the believers previously. Paul lists four important facts that he had previously given to the believers. Fact number one, Christ died for our sins. Fact number two, Christ was buried. Fact number three, Christ was resurrected. Fact number four, Christ appeared to many as the risen Christ. Now some have suggested that these points formed the basis for the earliest known Christian creed. Now, Paul says that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He died for our sins. The language of the Bible, when it uses the word for, carries the force of on behalf of or because of. So, Christ died on our behalf. 
Jesus, friend of mine, the Lamb of God, died as an expiatory offering on account of our sins. Jesus died as an expiatory offering on account of our sins. To expiate means to extinguish the guilt incurred by. Expiate means to extinguish the guilt incurred by. So when we talk about Christ's expiatory sacrifice, we mean that his death was capable of extinguishing the guilt incurred by man. His death was the means of extinguishing the guilt accorded by man. And his death was given for that purpose. The wages of sin is death. We deserve to die eternally on account of our guilt because of sin. And so now Christ died in our place to remove the guilt, oh yes, of Adam's sin and our sins, so that we will not have to die eternally if we accept his death in our place. And so, friend of mine, Jesus died to make an atonement for sin, according to Bible passages like Romans chapter 3, verse 24 to 26, Romans chapter 4, verse 25, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, and other Bible passages. So, Jesus died to make an atonement for our sins. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 declares, Hebrews 2, 9 declares, But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Taste in the language means to eat, to taste, to experience. Now, the passage does not mean, as some have suggested, that Christ merely tasted lightly of death and did not suffer the full measure? No. Gethsemane shows, what happened in Gethsemane shows, that Jesus drank the cup to the dregs and tasted death as no man had ever tasted. He tasted death for every man in behalf of every man, in behalf of every person. Christ's sacrifice was for all, everyone who wills to do so, may apply the benefits of the death of Christ to himself and thank God that he died in his place. O oh, friend of mine, Christ's vicarious death atoned for our sins, but thank God he did not remain under the power of death. Inasmuch as he did not sin, death could not hold him, and he rose triumphant from the grave. And so the Bible says clearly, not only did Christ die, but he was buried. Christ's burial certified that Jesus had indeed died and provided the necessary condition, the death preceding resurrection. You remember Joseph of Arimathea's request for permission to remove the Savior's body from the cross led to Pilate's inquiry concerning the truth of his death, according to Mark chapter 15 verse 43 to 45. The preparation for his burial, as recorded in the Gospels, and the account of his being placed in the tomb and guarded by Roman soldiers at the instigation of the chief priests, all give assurance that Jesus died. Matthew chapter 25, verse 57 to 60. Matthew 27, verse 62 to 66. And John chapter 19, verse 38 to 42, and other passages. So yes, friend of mine, Jesus died for our sins, firstly. Secondly, Jesus was buried. And thirdly, Christ rose again. Oh yes, friend of mine, for those who love the Bible language, the verb rose is in the perfect passive form and conveys the meaning that Jesus has been raised and is still alive. It conveys the idea that Jesus has been raised and is still alive. Now, the previous verb that he died and was buried occurs in what is called the aorist tense. It occurred as an historical event in the past. And this is in contrast with the continuous sense implied by the perfect tense. In other words, friend of mine, 
the Apostle Paul is emphasizing not only that Jesus had risen from the dead, but that he still continues in a resurrected state and that the condition of having thus been raised is a permanent one. So Christ arose on the third day and he continues to live. The song says, I serve a risen Savior. He is in the world today. Oh yes, friend of mine, but today we want to focus on the fact that he died. On a day like yesterday, they call Good Friday, he was crucified and buried. And on a day like today, Saturday, he was in the tomb. We thank God for his death on the cross for us. And so the hymn writer, speaking of the fact that he died in our place, says, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for someone such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away, it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of tears can ne'er repay the death of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, there I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. And Father, we just want to thank you that you died for us on a Friday like yesterday, and that on a day like today, Saturday, you rested in the tomb. And Lord, we thank you that you did not just remain in the tomb, but that you rose from the grave. And we will talk more about that on tomorrow. And now, Lord, we bring before you these prayer requests. Someone is asking that God will reveal his will for my life in my present ministry context. So they're trying to ascertain, Lord, what is next? What do you want them to do next as the minister for you? And Father, we claim your guidance. You said in Psalm 8.32, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eyes. So please guide this person, Lord. Reveal your will for their lives. Reveal your will for their life in the context of what they're doing presently in ministry. And Father, today now we pray for Luana and her family. She has lost her father. We pray that you will bear her up. That the same God who sustained Job when he lost his ten children, Lord, will sustain Luana and her family. That they would be comforted by your love. They would remember that you said in John 14, 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So please put your hands around them, dear Lord. May they sense the comfort of your presence. And may they look forward to the day when Christ will come and death too will die. And we shall see him, Jesus, face to face. Comfort this family, Lord. We pray for someone who needs strength to see hope beyond today. Maybe they're feeling depressed. Maybe they're feeling down or burdened. Help them to know that God's tomorrow will be better than today. Help that they would go to church today. Help that they would, 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 would seek to, to be kind to somebody else so that they themselves will feel refreshed by so being kind, whether it be by visiting someone in the hospital or in the prison or, or someone who needs a helping hand. Be with this person. Strengthen them that they will see, they will experience hope beyond today. Give them strength, dear God. You promise strength. You said in Isaiah 41, 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea. I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So, Lord, we claim this promise on behalf of this person who needs strength to see hope beyond today. And Heavenly Father, we pray for someone who is asking that you will be with their marriage. They're asking that you will be with the husband so that he would be faithful and honest. Father, we pray that this husband will realize that adultery and affairs is not something that is good because Hollywood presents it in the movies, but that it is a sin against God and their marriage partner. The seventh commandment says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. 
and that no adulterer will go to heaven. And so we pray, dear Lord, that you will help that this husband will understand that adultery is sin against God. And if he plans to go to heaven, he needs to ask you grace to overcome it, overcome that sin. Help him to be honest. We pray, dear Lord, that you will help this husband, Lord. His wife is asking that you'll help him to be financially stable and to return to God. We pray, dear Lord, that you'll hear the prayer that this wife is making on behalf of her husband, that you would help him to be faithful to the marriage vow, help him to be honest, help him to be financially stable, and help him to return to you. And Father, be with all the other prayer requests that we have made before, that we have placed in your hand. We pray, dear Lord, that you will answer these prayers, Lord, at the right time and in the right way. And may we today lift our hearts in gratitude for your death on Calvary for us. Thank you, dear Lord, that we can say today, at the cross, at the cross, there I first saw the light. Help that we will enjoy this Sabbath day as we focus on you and on the fact that you rose again and that we serve a risen Savior. These and other mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.